Hello everyone uh, and uh, welcome to this podcast uh, where we dive into the transformative power of artificial intelligence in the scholarly world. Uh, I'm your host Apurva Nagvekar and I'm working as Director of Data Science at Trinkai AI. Uh, so this is my first podcast uh, where I'm hosting, uh, where I'm basically hosting it. So please bear with me if I make any mistakes. Uh, so today uh, we are exploring how AI is reshaping scholarly communication, the integrity of uh, academic work and the future of publishing. With us, uh, we have Avi Stamen, a distinguished expert in AI technologies and uh, their applications uh, in, in academia. So he is the founder and CEO of Academic Language Experts, uh, which is author services company dedicated uh, to leveling the research playing field for ESL scholars. He is also co-founder of SciWriter.ai, uh, which is the first co-pilot uh, that helps researchers with their writing with responsible AI. Uh, Avi, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Aparva. And I have to say, um, I remember my first time that I was podcasting and hosting and I was nervous and I made all sorts of mistakes. So <laughs> okay. um, good luck to you. I hope yeah. that it goes really well. And even if even if there, there's always what to learn and improve, even if you've done a hundred of these. So yeah. thanks a lot, fun. Avi. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, so I, I hope I don't make many mistakes. You're, you're off to a good start, so no worries. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, so let's start with our first segment uh, that is on technical intricacies of AI algorithms in scholarly communication. Uh, so Avi, uh, could you share with us the primary AI technologies currently in use with scholarly communication? Yeah, I mean, so it's a really interesting question, and I want to preface by saying that I'm not like a you know, a technical expert in the sense that I'm not a computer scientist. So I'm not going to dive into the, you know, deep details or under the hood exactly what's going on. But um, the way I see it, there are a number of different kind of areas um, where AI, I would say, is already kind of disrupting or interrupting how it is that we do research or how it is that we approach uh, research. And then there's a whole nother category of higher education and learning with students, which is there's all sorts of um, you know, tools there. So I don't want to touch on the learning and students. We'll leave that for another time, maybe. But if we're thinking about research, so first of all, I like to think about the what I call generic AI tools, the general AI tools, um, which, you know, under those tools, I include ChatGPT, which I assume everyone's familiar with, uh, MidJourney for images, uh, Jasper for marketing writing. Those are These are tools that are created for the masses. Um, they're created for, you know, all sorts of different people in different places, um, and can really be used by a big, you know, swath of, of people. Um, on the other side, now, the problem with those tools is, so they're great in many ways, but they also come with their own set of issues. So, um, you know, probably you've heard of hallucinations or misinformation that some of these tools can, can provide. Um, and, or you may have heard of uh, situations where, uh, you know, it makes up references, uh, you know, that don't exist. Um, and all these things tend to uh, frustrate researchers for researchers really put a prime you know value on the truth and on and on fact and and we get really upset when we see these kinds of issues coming up. So what's happened is is actually there's been this kind of I would call it a, a subgroup of AI companies and startups that have been developed to help researchers work through the research um, process. So that could be, uh, a literature review and and asking you know questions to large language models that are that are built on the scientific literature uh, that can be helped with writing and editing tools that can be helped with research dissemination um, and these are all most of these companies are either you know uh, uh, companies that were founded by researchers or or research professionals who are really trying to address the specific issues that researchers have. So I'm I'm excited about AI in general, but I'd like to say that I'm specifically excited about the AI for research tools because I think it can really make a difference in how we work. I see. So can you uh, name some of the tools which are available uh, for scholarly researchers for them to use it or like uh, some of the applications like, you know, or the challenges like hallucination, uh, reference management can be solved using this like AI technology? Yeah. So if we go through like the, you know, the thought process of, or like the, um, the process of writing an article um, or, or even just doing our research, um, I think we can go through the entire lifeline of that process and think about, okay, what tools are available in order to help us at that specific point. So um, when I'm first starting out and I want to come up with uh, research questions, there's a brand new tool called research kick 
which was just put out a few uh, a few weeks ago that can help us like like brainstorm research questions and try to come up with what's new and what would fill a gap, which I think is really cool. Um, then if we move on to kind of research uh, liter literature reviews or or um, you know trying to understand that's which is a big problem because you know as the literature grows, it's hard for to to kind of you know stay on top of everything that's happening. So um, you know in that context, uh, you've got uh, consensus, you've got perplexity AI. Um, one that I specifically like is SciSpace. So SciSpace is a really cool tool where you can kind of go in, you can um, ask the literature questions and get answers and actually chat with the literature um, via the chat bot. Um, you can get suggested, you can get really smart summaries. So let's say I just want to know the methodology in the following five articles, I can do that. Or if I just want to know the results, or I just want to see, you know, uh, um, you know, who was involved, or maybe I want to find the people that were involved in that article, I can, it's very intelligent searching. So it's not just keyword and now I get a result and I have to go through all these results and most of them are not relevant. It's actually very relevant results to your study. I can track it in SciSpace, for example. I can I can sort it by what is the most recent literature, right? So I can see what's just been um just been produced. Um, so that's really cool in terms of like, you know, the the uh you know the 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 research and literature search. Um, you know, if we're moving down the line, I would say, uh, you know, their GPT can be used for data analysis, which is a cool use case. Um, and then there's the writing and editing um, thing. So, you know, when when it comes to writing, so I'm working on a tool now called SciWriter AI that, that you mentioned at the outset, um, which I'm very excited about, which is a structured writing process, especially for early career researchers, as well as researchers for whom English is a second language. Um, we just uh, uh, produced the prototype this week. And we're iterating on it now, and we're you we're we're actually looking for researchers who are uh, you know interested in getting involved in an early point in testing, so that we can really make the whole writing process a lot easier, take a lot less time, and write in really great English from the outset. Um, and then there are good editing tools out there. Um, you know, I know Trinka is uh, close to your heart, uh, Apurva, yes. right? Uh, with yes. editing uh, texts that are already created that already exist. Um, you know, uh, there are other companies out there that are that are doing similar things. Mm -hmm. um, which I think are still important, especially when you take into the fact the, the fact that you know the general tools again, like you know uh, uh, ChatGPT or like Grammarly, um, they generally are not trained on the scientific literature. So I think we we're, we're understanding through the AIs is um, you know the more that the the source of the information is reliable and trustworthy, the better the output of in general, the better the output is going to be, um, and that's why uh, you know. Uh, um, science-based. I'm always a fan of science-based, uh, you know, uh, research. I see. That, that's very insightful. Uh, building on that, like, you know, there are many companies who use ChatGPT directly in their product, right? Um, so uh, do you see that, like, you know, uh, it's a challenge uh, for end users to use it directly? Because uh, many of the time when you use ChatGPT directly or Gemini in that case, uh, like, you know, they are not fine-tuned on, like, you know, academic data or, like, research data. So uh, do they give good results or like uh, after using it, people feel that, you know, I should have tried something else or like, you know, uh, this model is not doing right because it's not trained on scholarly articles. So, yeah. so yeah. I mean, I think we need to remember what ChatGPT is and what it isn't, and that helps to frame the conversation. So first of all, what I would say is people oftentimes think that ChatGPT is kind of like Wikipedia, but personalized for them, right? It's like a Wikipedia they can ask questions to. Well, that's not really how it's built. It's built as a large language model. It's not a large information model. So I actually think that GPT's best use cases are around language, are around crafting language, editing text, translating text, summarizing text, um, you know, crunching and getting and, 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 and processing the information within text. When you're asking for answers to specific questions, then all of a sudden I'm not sure GPT, you know, is always the best solution, especially as it's not, you know, actively live connected to the internet. Um, so there are other tools, you know, that that either are extensions of GPT or work independently. Um, so Scholar AI is one that comes to mind where I can actually, or perplexity, where I can actually ask a research question and get a research answer that's based on the scientific literature. Now, it's not the entire scientific literature because a lot of the scientific literature is still, um, you know, blocked behind paywalls, which is a problem. Um, and it, it, it's hard to access that because publishers don't usually, um, you know, give away that information very easily. Um, but that being said, you know, I don't know, I'm just thinking about if we wanted to build, for example, a, uh, you know, a use case for doctors to get real answers to medical questions on the spot when they're treating a patient, 
I don't think we would want to use an LLM that was trained on Reddit, right? Or that was trained on, you know, uh, BuzzFeed. We want an LLM that was trained on the scientific literature. So I think that's, you know, I, mean, I, I even think that the scientific publishing, scholarly publishing doesn't even realize the, the value of its own content. Or, you know, maybe we do, but we haven't figured out how to monetize it yet or how to turn it into a product that can be really beneficial. So once you realize and understand that, well, in real use cases, we're going to want to build off the scientific literature. And this is our industry. This is our business. We need to figure out how we can level up to actually, uh, you know, bring that literature to, you know, to, to the to, to the use cases where it can really be beneficial. So, you know, it's this funny, it's this funny dance because on the one hand, you know, publishers tend to not like, um, you know, open AI and Claude and, you know, Anthropic who made Claude and because they ingested their content arguably without permission. But on the other hand, I think the only way forward is to combine the technology of, you know, these big tech companies with the publisher's content and, and to really get results that we're happy with. That's, that's very insightful um, and incred incredibly enlightening too. Uh, so like, I mean, uh, let's uh, try to move like, you know, from abstract concepts to concrete examples. Uh, uh, so, so like, you know, and, uh, like, you know, can you, uh, let's, let's focus on some of the anecdotes. So I'm particularly excited about this part. Um, and I also guess like our viewers too are pretty excited about it. Uh, could you share with us some specific instances where machine learning models or NLP techniques, uh, that have uh, produced significantly res results in academic research or scholarly communication, what you have experienced about it? Like, I mean. Yeah, I mean, one, you know, there's there's been a lot of really interesting uh, work that's done in in chemistry, actually, with predicting uh, certain chemical compounds that would be, you know, you have to run so many, uh, you know, so many scripts, you know, to do that manually would be impossible. But to come up with formulas for 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 drug production, um, I think is has been a really valuable use case. I don't know as much about that, but that sounds like a really interesting, you know, kind of application. Um, what I what's a little bit what I do understand a little bit more about is um, there were two researchers from the Technion Institute uh, in Israel who came up with this data to paper in an hour. And this was actually published in Nature, where they took a data set from the um, from the CDC, if I'm not mistaken, and they uh, ran it through GPT. Now, they were computer scientists, so they, you know, they, 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 they knew how to manipulate the algorithms, but they ran it through GPT. Um, were able to actually produce a legitimate study in an hour on, uh, I believe it was the health effects of uh, vegetable uh, consumption uh, amongst um, diabetes, uh, people with diabetes. Um, and it was just crunching data, really, right? But they knew how to take that, uh, you know, manipulate it and turn it into a scientific paper in a way that was, you know, really compelling. So, I think um, you know, there's there that that that's just one example. I'm not saying that everyone should be writing their papers in an hour. And of course, we run the risk when we allow these, you know, when we enable these tools that they can be used for bad as well as for good. So we need to keep an eye on that. Um, but I think like that's just an example where, you know, anyone who is listening to this who's had frustrations writing a paper before, um, and just, you know, is like, you know, breaking their teeth, you know, maybe because English isn't your native language, or maybe because uh, you know, you, you've, you know, you don't, you're, you're not used to writing in this scientific formula. I mean, that's what I'm trying to build at SciWriter, you know, to solve this problem. But I think to be able to actually bring that to fruition to, um, you know, to write the paper in an hour, um, you know, I think is, is everybody's dream. And, and while we might not get there tomorrow, um, I think it is an attainable goal if we chip away at it, um, you know, slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, that's very insightful. Uh, so just to update here, we at Trinka AI, uh, we are also working on some cool stuff like RLHF. Uh, so to give you an overview, uh, like, you know, we have our own in-house grammar error correction engine, uh, which has uh, really good accuracy and uh, it does uh, advanced grammar error correction. Uh, but sometimes uh, some of our clients need specific changes tailored to their domain or like, you know, for them. Uh, uh, so, uh, so then for them, like, you know, showing all changes may be like, you know, irritating feeling. Uh, so we incorporate RLHF on uh, uh, in-house grammar error correction model uh, using some sort of preferential data, which was provided by the client. And we saw that, you know, after implementing RLHF, uh, it moved towards the client need and, uh, 
we also observed that like you know with more preferential data uh, it was moving closer to crime need so now rlhf uh, just to uh, uh, like you know to simplify this like you know it's a reinforcement uh, learning technique uh, which was uh, on which on which the chat gpt model was built on uh, and like it was introduced in 2017 uh, by open AI, but like, you know, uh, after chat GPT it became pretty huge and we thought of integrating it in our application. And we also got uh, really good results with that. So uh, that, that was a pretty exciting part from iron as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, I'll be honest with you. I've done some testing and mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I did say before that I do believe in general in the power of, uh, you know, the, the, science specific models specifically when it comes to language i'm not yet sure um because i have been testing gpt and i have been testing you know and i've tested trinka and other other tools in the industry and i think on the one hand yes there's maybe it, you know i think it it trinka is or not trinka but just all these tools right um that are out there they are good in the sense that they're a little bit more careful and they know scientific language yeah. but they don't necessarily have the data set. I think that that some of the bigger large language models do. So there's a trade off there, right? And it's like, well, what's more powerful? Is it the more spe specific, you know, scientific terminology, or is it the ability to really reconstruct sentences that need a lot of help? So I think it depends on who you are and what stage you're at and how much work you need. You know, so the, for those researchers who just need like a kind of a lighter touch, but really to make sure that it's you know polished, I think that the tools that we've built in our industry are, are really powerful. And helpful but when if you're if you're you know really trying to improve like you know get your hands dirty uh, there i've actually seen you know uh, gpt be pretty impressive sometimes even yeah. better than some of the specialized tools true like just to add here like you know there are lots of open sourced uh, models which are there right now uh, and and there are like models like llama 2 then there's mistral uh there are the t5 family models uh so uh, they are trained on very lot of data right i mean and uh when you fine tune them using some small section of data uh, of particular academic domain then like you know it starts giving really good results and uh, we also observe the same thing, like, you know, if we train, uh, like, you know, model from scratch, then it might not give you very good precision or recall, uh, but uh, the accuracy might not be that great. But like when you use this open source model, then like, you know, it gives right, really good results. Uh, yeah. when, I, when, I, when I talk about this, like, you know, when I take like very minimal amount of data uh, in hand, like that's what like, you know, clients have, like, you know, most of the clients don't have like massive amount of data. They just have uh, like minimal amount of data, like thousand data right. points or like 10,000 data. Points. Also, don't forget that there's the level of repetition when it comes to academic text. I mean, it's not, it, it, maybe certain phrases are repeated over and over, but you know, the whole idea of academia is you're supposed to be always coming up with something new and novel and there's so many sub fields and niches that it's kind of sometimes it's hard to really you know kind of really fully uh capture everything that's going on in in in, in research so you know uh, just because something is trained on research a, a researcher in in literature is going to want something very different from a researcher in sociology is going to want something very different from a researcher in biomedicine right so um you know there's it's almost a never-ending right uh niche you know that, that that you can get into and and you know, I think it's still early days and we'll have to see over time what the best, you know, what really produces the best. And when I say best, you know, it's also a very subjective question. You know, I don't think a, one thing I've learned from being, you know, running academic language experts over the last 10 years and, and being actively involved in the author services industry is that, you know, within the range of good editing, there are different styles, right? And, and a lot of it is stylistic, right? So you have uh, people who really take a heavy hand and, and 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 really make the text better. And some authors like that and some authors don't like that. Some authors like maintaining their own voice better. So there's not like there's objective stand, gold standard of here's what a good paper looks like, right? A good paper can look like a lot of different things. Um, so we want to make sure, I think, that we balance between giving the, these, you know, a, a level playing field for researchers for whom English is not their first language, but on the other hand, not overdoing it and 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 taking away their their personal voice, um, you know, as well. So that's a balance. I see. Uh, can you throw some light on literature reviews? Uh, like you know how how like you know this AI tools are helping in literature review, especially in searching documents, like you know answering queries, uh, summarizing the entire document. Like. Yeah, I mean, you know, right now, the typical way that a researcher goes about a literature review, you know, you know, they may search PubMed, they may go onto Google Scholar and search there, and then they start going through each and every, you know, uh, uh, entry, and they're usually based on keywords. 
Um, you know, so if the keywords are generic, then you may get a lot of stuff that's not related. If the keywords are too specific, you might not get any answers. So it's really quite, it's funny because, you know, we always thought of Google and Google Scholar as like, you know, kind of the pinnacle of advancement. And now all of a sudden Google seems like it's kind of outdated, at least in this specific context, right? It, it's obviously still very good for, for many other things. Um, but what, you know, what, what tools like SciSpace and, 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 and Elicit is another really good one that I, that I recommend, um, what they can really do is, is like you said, first of all, is you have this tremendous corpus of, 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 of information. So if you just search for keywords, you're going to get all sorts of stuff. But if you ask specific questions, these tools know how to say, okay, I get what you're trying. I get a little bit more about what you're aiming, what your end goal is, or your research question is. Now I can direct you more specifically to studies that have addressed this specific issue. Um, and it's just a much more sophisticated semantic um, search than it is, you know, just a, a, a traditional keyword search. And what that, and, and then, so that's kind of part one to it. And then part two is what I mentioned before about the user experience and, and, and kind of the interface is instead of me going one at a time and looking through and finding out, I actually have this dynamic, um, you know, summary that I get um, where I see the summary of, you know, I, I may get a summary, I can get a layman summary. Let's say, let's say I'm not a researcher in the field or I study a different field, or I don't know, I have a relative who's sick, you know, God forbid, and I want to understand what the potential treatment plans are. I can go in and get a, a all, you know, a, a scientific summary, a layman summary. I can ask for, you know, specific methods and I can really, and I can almost converse, you know, I want to be careful not to make it too human, but I can converse and, and engage in a dialogue with an article, not just with a chatbot, but with an article and ask questions and I'm trying to understand better. Um, now, I want to give a word of caution. That can hallucinate as well. There's no, even if it, even if you have a model that's trained 100% on the scientific literature, that doesn't mean that every answer and every chat that I get is going to be accurate. Um, you know, I think these are, these are bigger challenges that we're trying to tackle. Um, but for me, the number one benefit is when we have these, you know, if let's say as a researcher, there are, I don't know, 300 articles in your field and there's no way for you to read all of them, all of a sudden there's this way of, of, of shrinking that down to 100. And then out of those 100, maybe I go through the summaries and I pick out 20 that I want to deep it, dig into further. And then I go and I read those articles. I'm not suggesting that we don't need to read articles anymore. The opposite. I'm suggesting that let's take the time to read the articles that are really most important to us and hyper-focus our attention on that as opposed to reading through a lot of articles where by the time we get to the end of the article, we're like, all right, that wasn't relevant. Next article, right? Which we, I think everybody has spent a lot of time doing that. Yeah, that's, that's nice. Uh, so I, I, I would also like to add that we have our own product called as Anagorade, uh, which helps users to effectively uh, do their literature review uh, by skimming through uh, you know, related papers. And uh, we also have a mechanism that extracts the key insights from the paper, performs summarization on that. And we also have something like, you know, co-pilot engine in place where researchers can ask questions to it. And uh, you know, uh, and and it gives answers accordingly. Uh, so we use your like you know technique like REG uh, concept, uh, where like you know the co-pilot uh, gives so that you know the co-pilot gives correct and accurate results uh, with by minimizing the hallucination. So I think uh, the most of the tools which hallucinates, I think by applying REG on that. Uh, you know, it tries to minimize it. I won't say like, you know, it removes the hallucination completely, but you know, the, the, the ratio of the hallucination decreases drastically. So, yeah. You know, and that, that's just a sign of how fast this industry is moving. Cause I didn't even know. Right. And I'm really excited to hear that you're, that you've been working on this. Um, Cause maybe, you know, there's just so many tools out there that it's, it's, you know, it's hard to keep up with all of them and make sure that we're on top of everything. So um, thank you for bringing that to my attention and I'll be sure to check that out as soon as we're yeah, sure. I think you should check that out. Yeah. I'm, I'm particularly interested in knowing the about the AI ethics part here. And I think you are primarily working on in this field. Uh, like, you know, so uh, can you throw uh, some light on it? Like, you know, like what is AI ethics? Like, you know, in, in so that it, it is understood to everyone. Like, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, no, it's not it, it's not necessarily my main field, but it's something that I think anyone who is building a tool in the AI space needs to take seriously and consider. Um, I would say, you know, AI ethics is a very is a very you know kind of broad broad question. It starts with how is the content ingested, right? Was it with permission? Was it without permission? And then how is the content? You know, what's the outputs that we're getting? Is it biased? Um, is it is it hallucinating? Is it you know? Um, there's all sorts of issues, but let's focus specifically on AI research ethics, okay? Because I think that's 
that's where I can maybe add a little bit more. And I think in the research context, you know, we've had for many years, we've had issues um, that have, you know, arisen with paper mills uh, and with, uh, you know, uh, just fraudulent research. And I think that AI tools are both the problem and the cure. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is on the one hand, AI tools can really be used to detect fraudulent research that never was able to be detected before. So for example, um, one really great example of this is image detection, right? So there are a few companies out there, there's Proofig, Image Twin, um, they're doing really great work in being able to automatically scan research uh, articles and determine whether there's duplicate images or there's fraudulent images or, you know, and 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 that's really important. Um, and we were, and I think everyone was surprised by how frequent this issue is. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the researchers are, are, are doing something uh, intentionally bad. Sometimes it's just a mistake of which image they put in, but it's quite frequent. So we need to address it and think about it. And that's a really great example of how AI can help solve a problem which always existed and now all of a sudden we're making the research literature better because of it. On the flip side, um, you know, if we're thinking about the, the 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 issues, well, all of a sudden, you know, there have been a number of stories recently where you know uh, studies have been published with the you know lines directly from GPT, right? It's very clear that GPT wrote this article or you know wrote big parts of it. Um, or uh, you know you have situations where AR artificial image you know artificial intelligence images. Are showing up in research papers now. If those images are actually accurate portrayals of the science, I have no problem with them. But as soon as they, um, you know, are are something more than that, then all of a sudden we have issues. Uh, okay, that's that's uh, uh, that's solid foundation of uh, for understanding AI ethics. Uh, what about data privacy in scholarly communication? How how we can ensure that, like, I mean, while using this uh, tools like ChatGPT or like you know uh, other other models. Yeah, that, that's a that's a really important question um, because specifically because there's a lot of misunderstanding. I think that people, you know, it's it, people oftentimes look at it as a binary: either it's safe to use GPT or it's not safe to use GPT. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. What I mean by that is, first of all, we need to be aware of what data we're handing over to uh, these tech companies when we're using their platforms, right? So, for example, at GPT, if you use the free version, they reserve the right, and I think makes sense that they do to use the inputs that you have given them to learn and to train the next round of their algorithms. Now, they may well turn around. They may, I don't think that means that all of a sudden your texts are going to show, are going to start showing up elsewhere on the internet. That's a common myth that I hear from researchers. Well, if I give them my text and all of a sudden someone else is going to be able to find it. I don't think so, but you are giving open AI permissions to use that for training their own models for all sorts of other things, which you may or may not be comfortable with. On the other hand, if you connect to you know, ChatGPT via the API and via the paid service, then all of a sudden um, they have, at least in their commitment and their terms and conditions, um, you, they're not gonna be learning from those texts. And in theory, it's entirely private. So um, that's, that's a really important question before you start using any tools. It's kind of, where is my data going? How is it being used? Um, and these are legitimate questions. Most companies have policies up on their website you know, to kind of uh, de de declare that. Um, again, I haven't yet seen scenarios where a researcher says, oh my God, I put up my data set into this tool and then all of a sudden I found it somewhere else online, um, you know, a, a week later, um, you know, and, and and kind of, you know, lose that, uh, that, that privacy. That being said, that doesn't mean it can't happen. It doesn't mean it's not happening in maybe, you know, in the dark web or, or in, other, in other places. So I think it's important to kind of check out the background of who's building these tools, right? Um, who's, have they gotten approbations from, you know, kind of, reputable sources? Um, are the people who have built things in the past, uh, the people that are involved in the scholarly in publishing industry, or are these kind of, you know, maybe uh, shadier players? Because in any market, right, and there, if there's an opportunity to manipulate, um, you know, someone will take that up. But that but that doesn't automatically mean that everyone who's doing this kind of thing is doing, is, is going to all of a sudden be starting to share your privacy. So I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I think that a balanced approach is right, whereby you're careful, you check, but it doesn't, you know, you don't need to not use any of these tools because someone might or something might. I mean, we even know, you know, even when you're submitting your article to a journal, right? You've got the reviewers who are seeing it, the editorial staff. At a certain point, we have to expose ourselves and we have to kind of share, right? Or if we share with a colleague who's going to give us feedback or, you know. So anyway, um, I think there's what to be said for, you know, kind of thinking mm -hmm. about, um, you know, what 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 is reasonable and, and rational when it comes to these questions. That's that's nice. Uh, so are we uh, for for the researchers who are basically listening to our talk uh, are very eager, like you know, to integrate AI into their workflows. So could you shed some light on like you know from where they should begin or like you know how do they can scale from novice to expert level? Like 
what what should be their foundation uh, whenever they want to integrate AI? Yeah, so it's funny you ask that because I asked myself the same question about six months ago. I started joining WhatsApp groups and started, you know, kind of like engaging with other researchers. And it was a little bit, it felt a little bit like wild, wild west, right? Where it was like, everyone was kind of, you know, uh, just learning on the, in a different way and it was chaos and it was... So I actually put together a course, a free course online called AI Tool Up Tuesdays. Um, and the goal for this course was actually to help researchers get some organization and, 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 and clarification around the different tools. And I actually invited the entrepreneurs who built the tools to come and present their tools as part of the course. So um, I, I know that's, you know, shameless self-promotion, but I do think it's a free course, so I'm not making anything off of this. Um, but you know, it's it's an opportunity for everyone to go in, and you can and you, and what I would suggest doing is looking at the subjects. So I, I tried to organize them thematically, um, and and so that you know, if you want to learn about how to do literature search with AI, you can do that. You want to learn about writing and editing with AI, you can do that, or image detection, or you know, anything else. So um, that's kind of the first um, you know step. And I and the second tip I would give is don't you know don't try to build a whole new workflow you know with 10 different tools, you know, tomorrow. Um, I think it's enough, you know, study, see what's out there. Um, you know, similar to what we said about the literature review, start with 10 tools, you know, think about which ones you want to learn about, see which ones are really going to be most impactful on your research. Start working with two, three tools maximum. Um, you know, maybe one day there'll be one big tool to rule them all. But for now, it's very siloed into different subject areas and different, different tools. So, um, you know, start practicing. Um, don't be afraid. Don't give up if you come across, you know, something that you think is a hallucination or isn't, you know, didn't give you the answer you wanted, continue practicing. You know, I, I like to compare it. I always say, pretend like you're engaging with an intern on their first day of work who has infinite potential for knowledge, right? They're a genius, but right now they don't know anything, right? So we need to teach them everything. We need to, we need to engage with them. We need to be very clear about how we prompt, how we give them instructions. Um, you know, and I think that's, if you, if you pretend like you're you have to describe it in the same way you would describe a new concept to a you know a four year old or a five year old or an intern. Um, I think that helps us to kind of get a better picture of what it is that we're doing. Um, you know, I I also have been doing more recently um, uh, boot camps uh, for academic universities where actually I come in um, either via Zoom or in person where I actually teach the researchers how to use these tools and we do hands on one or two day um, you know kind of deep dives into these tools. So that's another another way just for me to be able to teach. Um, you know, because I think it's really important. It's really valuable, um, but there isn't necessarily, because it's happened so fast, there isn't necessarily, uh, you know, a structured, organized course, um, you know, and that, that's what I've been trying to fill that gap. See, that, that's pretty, uh, pretty great. Uh, so I'll definitely try out your course. Is it on YouTube or like, I didn't think uh, no, what you need to do uh, is, uh, it's actually on the SciWriter website. Um, <laughs> so it's uh, and I can we can maybe share this in the uh, in the show notes, but yeah, uh, sure. SciWriter AI slash AI hyphen tools hyphen research. Uh, sorry, sorry hyphen four hyphen research. So that's SciWriter uh, slash AI hyphen tools hyphen four hyphen research, um, or just do a Google search for SciWriter uh, AI Tool Up Tuesdays, and it'll come up. And you just need to you know, and then you'll see all the whole course and you you can access it, you know, on demand whenever you want. That, that's great. I'll try that out definitely. And we'll also share this link on, on, our, on our page. Perfect. On our uh, yeah, I mean, uh, coming to the last question, like, you know, what do you think, uh, where, where are we going ahead? What's the future in scholarly communication? When we talk about generative AI, LLMs, what do you think about it? Yeah. So I think, first of all, there's going to be a, a legal question that's asked about, you know, kind of what are the AI you know, uh, LLMs able to ingest and whatnot? What are the licensing agreements around that look like? But then I also think there's a question of how authors are going to use it. How do we protect research integrity? How do we increase research integrity with AI tools? Um, and, and, and what does it mean, you know, for, and, and at what point do we start trusting AI for certain parts of the authoring process or certain parts of the data processing process better than humans? And that's, I think, a really scary question, but maybe an important question to ask, right? What, at what point do we have papers communicating with other papers, right? Um, and, 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 and how do we structure the metadata in a way that that is feasible? And I think these are exciting questions for researchers, but also scary at the same time. So, uh, you know, my approach is always, you know, the best way to get over any fear is to actually engage and actually start learning. Um, and I think that's where that's where we're at the learning stage now, right? And, and when, when when you learn and when researchers learn about these tools, so then I think um, you know they'll be able to really kind of 
uh, you know, understand where it works for them, where it doesn't work for them. And also understand that this is an evolving process, right? Where like, imagine everyone should think back to their first time using the internet and it would come up slowly, you know, on your screen and you'd have to know the exact URL to plug in. And, you know, I can imagine the back then many people were probably like, ah, the internet, you know, not such a, you know, not so helpful or Wikipedia, right? I know in academia, we were very skeptical of Wikipedia. Wikipedia, no, that's no good. We can't use that. And now it's like everyone uses Wikipedia and we've actually realized it's a great, you know, the crowdsourcing model is really can really be incredibly helpful. So anyway, point is, is that um, I think that's, uh, you know, uh, really kind of, let's continue experimenting, continue. It's an exciting time. Don't be worried about your jobs and all the fear mongering that's going on. Just start playing and experimenting. On the one end, you'll see it has big faults. And on the other hand, you'll see it has big opportunities. And that's, that's the way to use it best. Yeah, that's that's very thoughtful. Uh, it's it's clear that we are on the brink of exciting developments. Uh, I think that will definitely shape the uh, landscape of scholarly communications for years to come. Um, yeah, I mean, and and uh, so yeah, I mean, and with that, like you know, uh, we have. Uh, I I think we should conclude now today's podcast. Uh, I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to uh, Avi Stamen uh, for sharing his expertise and insight with us. Your contributions have truly enriched our understanding of AI and academic research. Thanks, Avi. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Prav. I appreciate the invite, and I look forward to continuing our chat when we know more about AI. Yeah, sure, definitely.